Joining us now is Mark Esper, who served as Secretary of Defense in the Trump administration. Secretary Esper, thank you for joining us tonight. You know, we wanted you to come on to talk about Russia and the monumental events that are happening there, and we will get to that in a moment. But given this breaking news and this stunning audio, I wonder what it's like for you to hear the audio of your former boss, the former commander in chief, talking about what we are told as sensitive military documents in this manner. Yeah, it really is stunning, uh, Caitlin, to to hear it, right? It sounds familiar in some ways. You know, I talk a lot, a lot about these instances in my memoir where I categorize how uh, every few months or so we would come back to this issue about Iran and what to do. And and I can say, you know, Mark Milley worked for me for nearly 18 months, which was most of Trump's tenure uh, that we were together. And he never advocated uh, for, for attacking Iran. If anything, uh, Chairman Milley and I were the reluctant warriors in the uh, in the cabinet urging caution, urging restraint. So that, that kind of is what strikes me first. But secondly, it's the nature of sharing those information, those documents, whatever they are, with people is clearly you know, unauthorized, e illegal, and dangerous. And that's what concerns me as well, that such things like that were, were, were kept loosely around uh, Mar-a-Lago. And he told Fox, as we played that clip earlier, he said there was no document, but referenced you know, newspaper stories, magazine clippings. But it sure doesn't sound like he's talking about just a magazine article there. Is it clear to you, does it sound like to you that he is holding a classified document? Well, it sounds like he's holding something and showing something. I don't know what it was. I, I think in, uh, earlier it was reported some time ago that it was a four-page document, which would not have been what DOD typically prepared. What we usually prepared was a one-pager that included targeting options and escalatory measures things like that. And again, I outlined it in my memoir fairly clearly, but uh, that would be unusual. But but something like that would be uh, a document that would generate that wow, of, uh, that wow effect, if you were, by people who are unfamiliar with these types of things or classified material. When you were defense secretary and you talk about, you know, the experience that you two had, and obviously you worked with him a lot, did you ever have concerns about how he handled classified information? Were you ever worried to leave anything with him or have to tell him, you know, don't share this with other people that aren't authorized to receive this information? I bring a limited number. Hello? Secretary Esper, yeah, go ahead. We can we can hear. I think we had a little bit of issue with the audio, but I think we can hear you now. Uh, we were asking, did you ever have yeah. any concerns about his handling of classified information when you were serving as defense secretary? Sure, we were generally concerned about uh, the handling of classified material within the White House writ large. And so we would only bring a few copies of whatever uh, options we would present to the president because we were concerned about those things. You know, having classified documents like that, uh, again, getting around, uh, the two top concerns to us were always, you know, risk to mission, right? What would it affect if, if the material was compromised? And then what we would say is risk to force. What, what would it mean to the soldiers, sailors, airmen, or Marines that might have to be called upon to do that mission? So those were two concerns that were forefront in our minds. And so we always try to control that information very closely. When you say you were always concerned writ large about, about and only took, taking a few documents, what do you mean? Well, you would sit in a National Security Council meeting, um, if, if you will, and you'd only expect a few people, and it always seemed like twice that many showed up, and everybody wanted a piece of paper. And frankly, not everybody had a need to know. Uh, the only uh, key people that needed to know or needed to see this were uh, typically the, uh, the president, of course, the vice president, the chief of staff, the national security advisor, the secretary of state. Uh, everybody else didn't need to have access to that information, but too often you'd have a lot of people in those meetings. And, and again, documents, uh, information being passed around. I know you've talked about your concerns about him holding office again, and you've said you wouldn't work for him again. Secretary, I that when you see the polls and that he is by far and large the Republican frontrunner and could easily have the nation's secrets in his possession once again, how much does that worry you? Well, look, I'm, I'm very concerned, uh, and I've said that I don't believe he is fit for office. And what I've argued to my fellow Republicans, and I say this as a Reagan Republican, is that, uh, look, President Trump had a number of policy accomplishments. You can't take that away from his administration. But my argument is we have a, a good field of candidates right now, most of whom can advance the same core GOP uh, principles, the same policy objectives, and do so in a way that expands the Republican Party and wins elections which is something that Donald Trump has been unable to do. So I'm encouraged by the field that is out there, and I hope that uh, 
that soon they will ascend in the polls and we'll see Donald Trump fade away. And, of course, whoever would be taking that nomination and could potentially be president would have a slate of global issues to deal with, including what we have been seeing happen over the last few days, you know, the fallout from this rebellion that happened in Russia. You saw President Putin coming out today. He made those very brief remarks after we hadn't seen him in public since Saturday morning. You know, he often tries to project this you know, strong man, you know, look and optics. Did you sense that today, or did he look weak to you today? What was your takeaway? He looked a little unsteady to me today, and I think the message he had was uh, was that he was walking a tightrope. On one hand, he was calling uh, the, the Wagner group that they were uh, rebels, uh, traitors in some ways, but on the other hand, telling them that, that, that they're forgiven and they can go back and either join the army or go back to their homes or go to Belarus. Uh, at the same time, he was, you know, promising accountability, but uh, still Prigozhin is is left to his own devices in, in Belarus as well. So it's very unclear what's going on. This is shaking him, shaking the country. And uh, it's going to be very interesting to see what happens in the coming days and weeks, particularly, you know, he's now fighting a multi-front war, one in Ukraine and one at home. And then, of course, he has to deal with the West as well. Yeah, and we'll see what happens there, of course, and questions just about the fact that they do have nuclear capabilities and the instability that we're seeing play out in Russia. Former Defense Secretary Mark Esper, thank you for your time and your expertise on that, but also your perspective on the Trump stuff as well. Thank you very much. Thanks, Caitlin.